Hello and welcome to Risky Talk, the podcast where we talk about risk and how to talk about risk. I'm your host, David Spiegelhalter, and this episode is all about communicating evidence and data to the policymakers running the country. It's not simply about bringing numbers together, it's about bringing a whole range of evidence together. You can't just do it from the centre with data scientists, this also requires a public conversation. When you're trying to hire people, you try to hire people who are able to communicate, not just do some maths, otherwise you're going to be missing out half of the impact of your work. The UK government has recently been brandishing the catchy slogan, data not dates, to explain its approach to easing out of lockdown. And the pandemic has made it vividly apparent just how important statistical evidence and modelling is for the decision makers. And it's brought data into the public consciousness like never before. But the government appetite for data is not new. In fact, we're recording this shortly before the census day in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. The census is a great example of the kind of data policymakers and governing bodies rely on. It gets used to plan public services, to allocate funding, and it influences policy on everything from housing and health to transport and education. Politicians and civil servants make decisions every day, and they need good evidence and data to support them, to design appropriate policies, but also to evaluate whether policies are working and gathering, analysing, communicating this evidence, which enables these decisions, is what we're exploring today. And as always on Risky Talk, we've got a really stellar panel. Dr Laura Gilbert is the Chief Analyst at 10 Downing Street, where she directs a data science and analytics team to promote evidence-based policymaking. Laura has a background as a particle physicist, She spent several years building a digital healthcare startup and is also an expert kickboxer. Laura, welcome to Risky Talk. Thank you. Professor Diane Coyle, CBE, is the co-director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. She's the author of numerous books on economics, which she likes to call the soulful science, including GDP, A Brief But Affectionate History, and a recent textbook exploring market, state, and the people, economics for public policy. Her career started out in the UK Treasury, and she has a particular research interest in measuring the modern economy. Diane, welcome to Risky Talk. Hello. And finally, John Aston has recently taken the baton from me as the Harding Professor of Statistics in Public Life at the University of Cambridge. He comes to the job after three years as the Chief Scientific Advisor to the Home Office and a distinguished career as a statistician. Welcome to Risky Talk, John. Uh, Hi, David. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us. Okay, as usual, we like to kick off by exploring what you're aiming to achieve. What are the objectives of communicating evidence and data? And as always, I want to ask, Are you actually trying to inform people or are you trying to persuade them? So, Laura, can I come to you first? Your team at 10 Downing Street was created fairly recently, and I believe you're the first chief data analyst they've ever had. So so why was the team created? What are the goals of your work there? Well, the overarching aim is to improve the use of evidence in government decision making, which is obviously quite a a broad target to hit. Um, But it does really encapsulate, I think, a a, a strong intention to uh, really make use of technology and improved sort of scientific methodology to make sure that we are making the best decisions available um, with the evidence that we've got and also improve the way that we collect um, and generate uh, evidence and data. So it's a, a lot of it is around building um, evaluation into the kind of policies that we're that we're designing. Um, so I think that the largest part of our work tends to be making sure that when when there's a policy decision coming up, we uh, try to find out what evidence is available, generate any you know new data we need to get our hands on. We work closely with departments who, of course, are able to be quite independent. So there's a lot of relationship forging to try to knit together our analysts from our group and analysts out in departments to um, sometimes build models together, sometimes QA existing models, um, and make sure that we're all on the same page so that there's a a real equality of information 
on the analytical side before um, the sort of various options are presented to policymakers. So we very much try to inform the policymakers of, of what the options are available, what's supported by data, what we think are um, you know, re reasonable choices to take and then allow them to decide. Okay, so you're informing them about what are potentially reasonable choices, but you're not pushing them in any particular direction. That wouldn't be our role, no. No, exactly. So can you, are can you allowed to tell us what sort of, you know, areas have you been working on? Any examples? Yeah, well, we really try to get involved in all major decision making. Um, that we think has got an evidence uh, backing. So uh, large areas of work at the moment would be around net zero. There's obviously been a lot of public service backlogs um, that have, have got worse due to COVID. So trying to figure out the evidence behind what kind of impacts we could have that would improve that situation as COVID hopefully draws to a close. The levelling up agenda is something that we're obviously working on quite quite hard so um, really anything that's that's going on in the departments that needs a, a central decision mm. yeah, yeah you've launched these number 10 innovation fellowships I mean you want to bring tech data figures into government uh, you know are things ch are really changing about the attitudes to data well I, I think significantly yes the innovation fellowships are obviously trying to bring in technology innovators we've also um, uh, started a new program which will be announced fairly shortly around bringing in data science expertise to work with us and also the Office of National Statistics on the sort of very uh, granular data that, that they collect. And those programmes really are designed to try and bring in a lot more outside expertise, a lot more viewpoints into the conversation and to try and speed up the rate of change, I think, really, because, you know, this is an, it's an oil system with a lot of history behind it. But there's there's very genuine um, drivers from right at the top to make uh, decisions really defensible, really well backed up by data, and to make sure that um, when we do fund things or when we do make decisions, we measure and adjust depending on how they're going. Great news. Uh, Dan, can, can I come to you? You're an economist and economists love data and you spent your early career in the Treasury. Uh, what do you see as the importance of collecting, analysing, communicating data to policymakers? I think it's incredibly important that they use the data, but also that they understand the limitations of the data and what is not being adequately measured. And some of that is that we could do with a lot more data being collected than, than we have. So, for example, about air quality in um, different areas, because we have understood what an impact that's had on people's um, uh, uh, prospects during the pandemic, for example, or understanding better local transport connectivity or broadband access. So the granularity of the data we collect about infrastructure is very poor. So I'm all in favour of um, resourcing that much more as a, a sort of public good, a, a, bit, a key bit of the national infrastructure in itself. But I'm also concerned that people using the data understand understand its limitations also. Um, you mentioned my book on GDP. That's a great example because the media and politicians get quite worked up about the quarterly change in GDP, and it might be a number like, you know, recently minus two, but normally uh, plus 0.3 or plus 0.4. And the uh, uncertainty around that is very large indeed. So the revisions might be sometimes zero, but sometimes as big as the change itself. And this changes the stories that we tell about the economy. So recessions have been revised away as uh, the data gets revised subsequently. And we're just putting too much weight on it. The one place where you can see that is in the Bank of England's inflation report, where they publish um, forecast uncertainty, but also uncertainty around the past. So even at the moment, I mean, particularly at the moment, but in normal times, there's just great uncertainty about what growth in GDP actually is. And that's because it's not a natural object. You're not trying to measure a temperature somewhere. It's a, it's a concept. There's lots of judgments and lots of detailed information that go into its construction. And so my, part of my communication is, sure, understand the data, but be aware about the uncertainty of what we have and also what we don't have 
And on top of that, what is really hard to measure but matters a lot also, which matters for people's you know, economic and social and health outcomes. Yeah, I, 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 I must do an aside on that because you're talking about the Bank of England fan charts and I, I love those. And I always say, well, look, you know, they're highly uncertain about what's going to what's going to happen in the future. They're not sure of what's happening at the moment. and They're really uncertain about what happened in the past as well. So I, I think they are good displays. We'll, we'll come back to the uncertainty and the quality and the limitations a bit later. But for the moment, I'd just like to press you a bit more on, uh, you know, why is it important to have them the right metrics and indicators? I mean, do you think there is a danger of, of people getting sort of obsessed with the wrong numbers? The, the things that people are obsessed about change over time, depending on what's happening. So at the moment, one of the key indicators that policymakers are interested in is productivity. And that's because it's low at the moment. Sometimes it will be the balance of payments or the unemployment numbers. And, and so it reflects um, the, the changing concerns and pressures on people. And that's a way, I think, of understanding that um, the lived experiences of people around the country matter to um, inform you about the salience of the different kinds of data that you're looking at. And so you can't just do it from the centre with data scientists, magnificent people as they are. This also um, requires a kind of public conversation a two-way conversation, not just that we're communicating what the data is telling us, but that we're hearing back from people who are experiencing what's going on, what matters most to them. Oh, well, I can't resist asking you, asking you then about the issue of opening up data for public consumption to, to much wider audiences for them to look at. I mean, you've written a report on the value of data. Uh, how important do you think that is, that, that actually there are more people looking at the data than just the government experts? Oh, really important. I mean, not just because um, we want to, other people to understand and um, hold to account policymakers, but because they can do really useful things with it. Loads of examples in transport of people who have ad- had access to data sets and delivered really useful online services on, on top of that. So it's a way of growing the economy. And um, one of the things that I'm interested in the, in the data debate is who is allowed to access what data and for, for what purposes. And I think we need to really get into the weeds about those kinds of permissions and therefore opening up much more data for use. And even within government, the Office for National Statistics is developing um, a platform where government itself can see much better what is going on by being able to join up different data sets. But, you know, obviously, as, as you know well, there's that trust and legitimacy issue to be worked through. Yeah, absolutely. But I think this is so important. And COVID has shown the value of having downloadable data because uh, people have done extraordinary things with it. And uh, I, 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 um, I, I think it's really proved that lesson. OK, John, can we come to you? You were chief scientific advisor to the Home Office up until last year. Well, I'm sure there wasn't much to do there. You know, they're responsible for immigration, policing, the legal system. Um, but yeah, I'm sure you had a little bit of work to do. Um, and some of which, or most of which, you probably can't tell us about. But never mind. What, what were you actually aiming to do there? And what, what kind of evidence were you working with? And who were you communicating to again? So I think the most important thing that we were trying to do there was to bring uh, evidence to the table so that um, any decisions that were being made could be informed by those by the evidence. I think um, there are lots of people uh, in the Home Office and outside who bring really valuable insights into what is going on um, and uh, policymakers. So that's both um, the ministers and uh, civil servants uh, have to make decisions uh, on a daily basis about a whole wide, whole range of things and making sure that they have the best evidence available to them in those decisions, noting that there are all sorts of pieces of evidence that need to come into any decision uh, is really important. And so my role was to make sure that they were accessing that um, uh, that evidence and that also that I was there to challenge the, their thinking in ways, in ways so that you didn't have um, a sort of group think uh, mentality of this is the only evidence that we ever see and therefore these are the only policies we ever determine from it. Uh, part of it was to make sure that they were seeing other evidence that could come from uh, other places. So again, like Laura, presenting a range of possibilities, exploring the options, informing rather than persuading. Is there anything you are allowed to tell us about? <laughs> well, I mean, I think so. I think that um, uh, there's, there's there's lots of uh, uh, lots of good examples. I think um, immigration is a very good one. I think um, there is uh, there's lots of um, data that comes in about immigration, but it's a very difficult area um, because um, there is not only simply numbers. These are people 
and um, it has lots of implications in many different uh, many different areas beyond simply people crossing the border. And I think that uh, one of the things that I found in the Home Office that was most important was that it's not simply about bringing numbers together. It's about bringing a whole range of evidence together and really trying to integrate evidence from uh, the social sciences, the economics, as well as uh, you know numerical statistical information. Laura, what do you feel about um, you know that things aren't just data that we have to add in evidence from other sources as well? Yeah, I mean, I feel very strongly that's true. That there have been quite a few very interesting points that have come up um, in the from Diane and John. Um, it, it's it's very difficult communicating evidence, as we all know, and. It's very difficult, particularly, I think, because unless you've got it, well, even if you do have a sort of strong scientific training, um, there are a lot of different ways you can communicate numbers to get different outcomes. And quite often we do have, uh, there, there can be sort of moral issues around getting that pitching wrong, overly influencing people or not giving them enough evidence to make the right decision. Um, you know, for all, the, all of the best will in the world can have some quite negative outcomes. Um, so, you know, these ideas around communicating risk, communicating, uh, you know, the weight that you place on different types of data, it, you're often playing up against a lot of confirmation bias. You see this particularly in things like, for example, the COVID death statistics. Uh, people that want to believe there are more deaths believe that a cutoff of 28 days is completely, in, you know, unacceptable. And you know, people that want to believe that there are fewer deaths, they think that you're just including absolutely everybody who's died who's ever had a sneeze. Um, and sort of the subtleties around those sorts of things, if you don't explain them well, can have a very big impact on outcomes. We find a lot with behavioural science data, for example, is very, very valuable. You can get a lot of very uh, useful insights um, into how people behave, how people react to things. And you can use that in a predictive way to figure out which strategies are more likely to be successful in controlling something like a virus. Um, but there tends to be a lot of bias in the system that because it's not, you know, a, a, a number that, that has decimal places after it, that it might be less trustworthy, less valuable. So, you know, the, the way that you actually look at and, and communicate risk and communicate um, predictability as well, you know, you can have models that, that appear to have very strong predictability, but still are very unlikely to be useful, for example. So all of these sorts of things it's a very difficult area and I think we do best by bringing in every kind of data and every kind of piece of evidence that could be pertinent, reviewing it, and then we attempt to make a confidence assessment and, and, and try and guide people into how to think about it. That's, I, I really like this. I mean, all three of you have, who love data and realise enormous value of it have all emphasised the limitations of the data and that we need to know a lot about it we need to know whether it represents what we think it represents and the need to really uh, reflect a wide range of different types of evidence um, when we're when you're communicating and um, so I, it's, it's a great a great sort of lesson we've already got I think from your three different perspectives So I'd love to move now onto onto the audiences, because we always emphasise that knowing your audience. And uh, so, you know, what about your audiences, um, Laura? Let's start with uh, working with civil servants and politicians. I was recently involved in um, a training course, a data masterclass that had been set up for very senior civil servants and politicians, and um, you know, and that was with this aim of improving the, in a way data literacy or whatever, um, of, of very senior people in, in government. I, great, I went to number 10 to film, so I thought that was really cool. So, but, you know, we know that the people that you all work with in government and, and policy don't tend to have a scientific quantitative background. And that's fair, that's fine. So how, do you, how have you found the sort of, well, I, to, for want of a better term, data literacy in government? Well, um, of course, as you know, our, our team set up this data masterclass, which has been incredibly well received and uh, uh, a very high percentage of the senior senior civil servants have got, taken the masterclass and really enjoyed it, particularly your talk. Um, we've had lovely feedback on that. Uh, but uh, part, of, part of the reason for doing that sort of thing, I think, is that a, a large part of our role is to help decision makers to be better consumers of evidence and data. So 
um, it, it doesn't help if you present the best analysis ever, if you, you know, you have an audience that can't understand it and doesn't understand why you're doing it. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot of work involved in working with people who really do want to make the best decisions and perhaps don't have the background for it to improve their understanding. And that's just a key part of the job. When you're trying to hire people, you try to hire people who are able to communicate, not just do some maths. Otherwise, you're going to be missing out half of the impact of your work. So it's, a, it's absolutely crucial. And you have to be able to take into account people's implicit biases and also their motivations, you know, what, what they are, um, what they're tasked with doing before you present them with the evidence that you have, I think, if you want a good outcome. Do you check whether people can actually understand what you're showing them? I'm thinking of all the sort of graphs that went up at press briefings or whatever, which were, you know, for everybody. Um, and I sometimes feel that certainly early on that those weren't really checked for whether <laughs> anyone had any clue what they actually meant. Well, I, I hopefully you'll have noticed the understandability and uniformity of the slide packs going up in, in they recent certainly times. Have. Um, Was that a, yeah. I, who, <laughs> Good. Who, who have we got to credit for that? Because they really have improved hugely. Yeah. Actually, well, who we have to credit is that one of, one of the things that we're doing, and we found a lot of collaborators for this, is trying to build a lot more um, sort of mesh analytical groups. So there are maybe five analytical teams that have people now reviewing those slide packs and having input on it. There's also a lot more testing with the public. So it goes through a couple of rounds of review generally um, to make sure that people, firstly, that the data, you know, first step, the data that goes into it is accurate and appropriate to represent. And then secondly, that it's, that it's understandable. And there's a joke going around that basically the analysts take the first part and then their mums take the second part. So. Exactly. I was, was told off recently when someone did say, I always check it with my mum. And so why is it always mums? Why isn't it dads who gets checked? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a good question. Mums are more opinionated in our, in our circle. <laughs> okay. John, what's your experience in the home office with your audiences and uh, how you got on in the, you know, how do you adapt what you say depending on, on the audience and their, and their background skills perhaps? You know, I mean, so I think there are a number of, um, different audiences in the home office. So um, the home office itself has quite a large set of people who would class themselves as analysts. Um, and uh, there were sort of, you know, a good few hundred of them. And they are doing everything um, from statistics, operations research uh, to social um, uh, research. And they would be quite a different audience to a senior civil servant or a minister. Um, but I think very much as, as, as Laura said, um, most people are really interested in trying to understand. They just have different backgrounds. And I think what uh, you need to really um, uh, sort of make the most of the fact that there is that enthusiasm to understand, but uh, also be very careful to make sure that you are continually checking that you are not trying, not losing people. And also that you're not, you're not saying things that they obviously do know. Um, uh, you really need to try and get that balance right. Um, and I think, you know, most people have a, a real um, willingness to, to, to make that effort to understand, um, but they want to be helped through it. And then you also have to really try to um, uh, work out the best way to do that in advance, because, you know, people have limited amounts of time and trying to, to think about the way to do it uh, from the outset is really important. And it's something I would encourage anyone who interacts with policymakers, be it um, uh, people inside government or academics coming in uh, from outside, uh, to really think about the people that you would um, uh, want to talk to. H how would you talk to a colleague in a very different discipline uh, about something that you're passionate about, but they may not have any real knowledge about, but you would treat them as an equal because they are uh, you know, an equal in another discipline. So how would you do that is a very good way to think about how to talk to policymakers. Yeah, I mean, as a fellow statistician, I, you know, we, we've all had to learn how to excise the statistical jargon from, from everything we do. We're having had a lifetime of using these awful terms of statistical significance, and et cetera, et cetera. You've got, got to ditch them. Yeah. OK. Diane, and you're, you know, when you're the communication that, you know, you're concerned with, again, how have you found that, you know, the policy people, politicians, uh, you know, how do, how, how do you adapt what you say and how you treat the, the evidence and the data to the audiences that you've got? 
There's a nice Keynes quote that's something like, the last thing a politician wants is any evidence that will overturn a dearly held uh, relief. Um, the ones I deal with tend to be economists where the level of numeracy is high, so that makes it uh, easier in that sense. But I think it's really important to um, be able to communicate in different languages. And that's either across disciplines, as John was saying, and a lot of our work at the Bennett Institute is interdisciplinary. And the first part of the conversation is always how do you talk to each other about, about what you're talking about. Um, but also, it isn't just the immediate policy audience that matters. Obviously, policymakers are part of our key, our key audience. But I think that broader conversation with the media and the general public is really important also. I mean, partly because that what's being said by the newspapers and online and, and um, broadcasters affects what policymakers um, can think about. It affects their window of feasibility. So that's a, a really important feedback loop you have to be aware of. But I think also this point about more broader public legitimacy. Economists are really influential in government. There's something like 2,000 in the Government Economic Service. And I think there's a responsibility on us to have that two-way communication with people in the general public. So each year I co-direct um, a professor of economics in Bristol um, where we um, deliberately rule out any jargon. There's a clacks and goes if anybody uses a jargon term. And we get large audiences that are really, you know, people are really interested in these very important issues about their lives. And it's so important to empower them to have that conversation with people who come along and say, oh, but I've got evidence that shows that this is the case. I, I, this is wonderful. I love it. The, you know, the two-way communication the um, and, and also the, I, I interested in as Laura mentioned developing good design so that you know the public can understand it and if you've got good design everyone should be able to understand it better and feel and feel happier uh, ab about that. Um, do you think that the COVID crisis, where we've seen more data being communicated by media and and government than ever before, uh, what do you think that's done to the you know, essentially the, the audience, both public and policy, and um, the, the, their willingness to accept um, evidence presented as graphs and so on. Do you think things will have got better? It's been divergent, don't you think? I mean, on some social media circles, there's a whole bunch of people who are interested and have, have really tooled themselves up to understand the evidence better, including its uncertainties. And then a different audience, which is... Um, happy to believe all kinds of quotes, fake news that are being um, being spread by people. So that sort of broader audience would be the one that concerned me more at the moment. And you know, one of the great things about the online world is that we have created a whole community of um, uh, well-informed amateurs who can bring their own expertise to bear, and we get all of that insight uh, in addition to the professionals who are doing it, and that's fantastic. Um, but there's this um, this other side of it as well, which is more troubling. Ah, yes. I mean, I've learned a huge amount from the as you said, the amateurs out there on on social media, and I, I follow a, a large number of them. Then, I mean, we could go on to misinformation and dealing with it. Yeah, well, okay, why not? Okay, that, that's that is an issue because there is an audience out there that is clearly susceptible to misinformation. Uh, any of you got sort of strategies that you've sp been specifically using in order to counter? misunderstanding Laura yeah well we don't we don't face this exact level of you know the, the kind of anti-vax style 5g conspiracy obviously isn't going on heavily inside government um, but what, what I think you do what I think you do find is quite a lot of confirmation bias so um, it, it's it's difficult to know how applicable that is to the real world but we use a lot of visualization a lot of um, sort of interactive visualizations that you can run your own sensitivity analysis effectively as in um, you know people might have assumptions around murder rates that you know and how they relate to deprivation for example that aren't actually played out but they're, they're strongly held because it's the impression that we have of the world so actually giving people a tool where they can view it and then they can make changes to the system and see how much impact that has on the outcomes that tends to be a very good way to get people to effectively self-challenge their assumptions and i and i think um, giving people tools that they can that are well thought out that attempt to communicate some idea of risk and uncertainty and give them a way to interact with the system people are much more receptive to changing their underlying assumptions if they can see it themselves than if you just tell them 
So we, we, we tend to focus a lot on um, sort of putting the tools into the hands of the person that, you know, needs to make the decision. I really like that. But so allowing people to play with the what ifs allows them to check the assumptions. And, um, and so in a way you are recognizing there are misunderstandings, confirmation bias, and you want to be able to uh, allow the tools to counter that. Yeah, Diane, what do you, what do you feel about dealing with with misunderstandings or, or just pre-assumptions, so this is how it, how it is. There are some lovely tools out there. The Institute for Fiscal Studies has a nice one where you can work out where you are in the income distribution. And I've used that with students and often they're quite surprised about where their families turn out to be. So those kinds of tools are fantastic. But many people don't have the inclination or time to do that. And uh, the, a lot of the conspiracy theories or fake news are playing on very understandable concerns and fears that people have as well. And so I, I've started to think about it in terms of um, storytelling and that kind of communicator who are very far away from the scientific roots that we all have. Um, but if you think about someone like the late Hans Rosling and the way that he was able to turn that statistical rigor into very understandable stories that spoke to people, um, then that might be a, a fruitful way to think about this when you come to the, the broader public. I, exactly. I mean, we, we've discussed that a lot in our in our group about the role of narrative, about embedding uh, the data in stories. I, I'd, can, can we talk about that a bit more? Because I, I am, you know, the, I always the, the standard cliche is that data doesn't speak for itself. Uh, we have to give it meaning by embedding it in some sort of context or narrative. Um, how can I ask any of you? How could how can you do that and be, tell a gripping in a way story without uh, pushing people into one way of thinking about things? I think this is a challenge I feel we're, we're stuck with all the time. I'd love to know how you manage to deal with it. How do you, how do you be sort of interesting and vivid at the same time not tell such a, a gripping story that uh, you're pushing somebody, John? So I think for, for me, there was always something about the fact that most of the time, the subject matter in itself was interesting. It's not that um, uh, you had to convince people that this data was about something that really wasn't, they weren't interested in. And I think that somehow to make sure that you were bringing in, again, that the other evidence that comes from other sources can really help um, enliven that, that debate. And I think as long as you're fair in terms of presenting the information um, in an informed way on both sides um, and then helping people to understand uh, what is happening, uh, what, what the information is saying, particularly what the information isn't saying, um, and what you can do to go about and get further information that could help answer some of the questions and really understand what the questions people are asking are rather than just trying to give information. If you really want, to, if you can really understand the um, the way that people really want to understand what, what their questions are, um, if you understand their questions, then you can give the information in a way that um, really uh, is exciting, uh, but doesn't necessarily uh, inf uh, uh, persuade one way or the other. Okay, John, tell us about tumble dryers. How did you make tumble dryers vivid and interesting? <laughs> well, so tumble dryers were vivid and interesting. So, I mean, I, I won't talk about the specifics around tumble dryers, but... Um, uh, uh, you know, there was a risk around tumble dryers and there was um, uh, and and people were genuinely worried about whether they should use their tumble dryer or not. So sorry, what was the risk of what were they going to so do? So the risk of fire. So there was there was there was a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a while back uh, there was some there was some serious concerns around whether they were you know, tumble, using tumble dryers were risky. And I think, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, concern in government about really understanding what that risk is and uh, really understanding, you know, because, you know, fires happen uh, uh in, in, in normal circumstances anyway, and you're really trying to understand what the whether there was an increased risk uh, for certain tumble drives. And try, that, that actually had real, you know, there were real impacts. You could see it in the media. People, you know, were losing their homes because of, uh, of fires. And therefore, uh, people, you know, rightly uh, got concerned about this and therefore uh, trying to make sure that that was, um, uh, you know, well understood, but that the real uncertainty around those risks and what those risks, um, uh, what those risks were, and how to communicate those risks was something that was uh, became actually very interesting to a number of people. Yeah, yeah. They, they, um, Laura's mentioned this idea of um, a way allowing people to play with the data. Um, so that brings us on to this uh, idea of dashboards and um, you know making data available to everybody, and maybe some models so people could do what ifs. Um, I, I think I'd like to explore that because of this, as Laura mentioned, this huge move towards you know, integrating data from different sources, 
putting it on people's desks. Laura, where do you see this see this going? What you know, what, what's the importance of this of this movement? Well, the, I mean, the main purpose is around information equality. So making sure that everybody has the same fair view of all of the available evidence. And that gives you a lot of space to incorporate expertise into the sort of translation of that into real life. Um, and, and it is something, I mean, we've been sort of talking broadly around uh, data sharing and you know visibility. So th- there are issues with visibility of data in government. Who owns it? Who's pre- prepared to share it with who, or who feels they're legally able to? There are of course risks around you know accidentally using personalizable data. Um, so it's not completely trivial. Uh, and also how much we should release data etc. to the public. And this this is a very interesting field because I think. Ethically, certainly data scientists and people on the analytics side, we're probably all inclined to release absolutely everything to everybody and get as much challenge as possible. Um, And that is the world that we, I think, genuinely want to move towards. It does then brush up against, though, this problem with people that are going to willfully uh, use that kind of thing to, to damage the system and there can, there can be an ethical problem if you you know if you release data that that people then use to cause har- active harm um so i think it's a genuinely very difficult area we it, you know accurate visualizations really help people to understand and um go into data making sure that you've got all of the evidence that could be reasonable to include in that is absolutely crucial and difficult to do not trivial but very much the way the system needs to move and i i see in uh, you know uh, certainly within government and expert advisors etc in the not too distant future almost you know all evidence is very public but it definitely is a challenging environment to do it in at the moment. Um, there's a high perception of the risk. Every time you come up with what you believe is a well QA'd model, you know, with good data in it and the best sort of assessment of the risks and expectations around it, it's still very difficult to get something like that released to the public when you know the level of backlash oh, that, that, that's oh, going to come in. It's it's challenging. Oh, that, can I ask you all about that? It's something I feel, you know, is, is so interesting where you do have this um, you know, move towards wider data, data being made available uh, within, within government. And uh, I think, UK is pretty good at it. Oh, sorry, I, I got a bias, of course, because I'm on the board of the UK Statistics Authority, who's trying to look at all this stuff. So um, I, I, I think we're doing rather well at it. But then what you're saying is that people say, oh, yes, but we, we can look at this, but we can't let anyone else look at this because they would uh, misrepresent it or use it wrongly or not understand it. Or something like that. I mean, I, I, I realise, of course, as Diane's emphasised, you know, there are limitations. We got to we can't pretend this data is you know, are absolutely you know uh, God given truths. But um, as you said, the the people in the middle tend to say, "Oh, come on, let's open this up," and there is reluctance to do that. Have have other John and Diane? Can I ask you about that? The, whether that's something you've met as well. There's a great deal of caution for very understandable, understandable reasons, as Laura's saying, but it's very important to start um, testing this and trying sharing some data because otherwise it becomes an illegitimate activity. You've got people in government using data that they won't share with anybody. That, that in itself holds longer term dangers. And I think we need to start doing this case by case and um, using the structures that we have. You know, the Office of National Statistics in the UKSA are fantastic bodies of, uh, of people and a lot of, a lot of expertise in this. So I think we just need to start the journey. And try to take the, uh, the decision makers along when they realise, well, maybe this isn't going to you know, cause chaos and disaster if we just give people access to some of this basic information. There is a genuine moral issue. So, you know, if you're releasing data about something that's relatively long term, low impact or, you know, it's very reasonable data, that that should always happen. When it comes to something that affects the number of people who are going to die in a very real sense around COVID, I think you do. I think there genuinely is a moral question, because if you release something, get it badly wrong and the end result is that people lose arguably even more trust in the system or um, are prompted to disbelieve everything you say or somebody very credible comes out and reinterprets the thing that you're trying to express as you know 
don't don't worry, you can behave in a certain way and not be at risk when that's not in fact true, then you do end up genuinely with dead people. And I mean, morally, I think that every piece of data, so long as it's cleaned, it can't, you know, you can't identify individuals, you can't harm people with it, you can't use it to track people in ways that would be detrimental to them. It should should be public, you know, models should be public, evidence should be made public, papers that, you know, decisions are made on. Um, it would make for a much more accountable system. But the flip side is that, and we particularly see this in COVID, when you, when you um, communicate the evidence badly or you leave it wildly open to interpretation, you can kill people. So again, we can bring that to uh, preempting, knowing the audiences, knowing almost what might be said, what got wrong, what misrepresentation might be made, and trying to preempt that in some way. If anyone knows how to do that, <laughs> yeah, exactly, John. Any ideas? No, I mean, I think there is there is something about um, there's something about timing, and there's something about I, I don't think I think there is often a view um, uh, amongst people that it's an all or nothing. And I think you can, you can. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It can be slowly, carefully uh, done, and more and more data is released. I know that certainly um, uh, there were times when uh, being able to have the freedom of the conversation, um, uh, in order to be able to really kind of go into the data, really understand the models, and really have those discussions with um, uh, both those who are building the models, but also the policymakers who are going to use those models, was really helpful to be able to do that uh, in a, in a quiet, understated way. But then I do think that, uh, you know, at some point in time, it would be very valuable for that to then be, you know, there to be the assurance that that was done well by the data and the models being released. I think it's a matter of timing. Um, and I think that um, getting that timing right can assuage a lot of fears. But it is always going to be, you know, some, something where people are going to worry about what other people, what other conclusions other people will draw from their data. But if, the more we can get into a mindset of that's a good thing, because it actually helps us understand what's going on, then uh, the better. Yeah, Diane, can I actually, actually, you know, come back to uh, GDP? I mean, there's a number, one number, uh, which, you know, lots of claims are made about and people are obsessed about. Um, and yet, uh, as, you, as you argue, is perhaps not the, um, you know, that golden mathematical truth that you might, uh, that people might think it is. It's a, a challenge that I don't think anybody has the solution to. We know that the one number is important because it's linked to things like jobs and incomes that we all care about but it doesn't tell the whole story. And there have been many attempts in um, economics and um, international agencies and researchers to develop alternatives. And they tend to come up with uh, so-called dashboards, but actually they're not dashboards. They've got 50 indicators in them. And there's a real art um, and as well as science in figuring out what's the picture, what's the unified picture or story that you uh, pull out these 50 numbers in, in the dashboard. Or, or they tell you things that you already know. So if you put a high weight on the environment, then you're going to pay more attention to environmental indicators, but that's the interest that you've brought to it. So I don't think we know the answer to this question about what would be a compact dashboard that people can understand that tells you the state of the economy. It's not going to be like a Star Trek control room with Mr. Spock able to grasp all of those um, multiple numbers and visualizations in one go. It'll be something much lower dimensional than that. But I don't think we know what it is. What are the right things to put in it or how to present it? Well, that, uh, then we come back to the point you raised earlier on about uh, maybe the uncertainty and about the, the quality of the underlying evidence and the fact that the data isn't, isn't everything. How, how uh, for any of you, how does one best express, given this, you know, the, all the, the evidence you've got, how do you best communicate the fact that it does have really strong limitations and you should not think that this is the whole story? Part of it for me is being on the same side as the, as the audience and not doing, in a, doing it in a top-down way, coming along and saying, I'm the expert, I have looked at these complicated numbers, you don't need to worry about it because I can tell you what, what the answer is. It's a, it's a shared endeavour of trying to understand what's happening in the world. And the information that you can get from um, detailed conversations, the kind of granular knowledge that you can't capture in a data set, it would be much too um, onerous to, to, to gather all of that. Um, that's, that's really part of what we're all grasping towards, I think. Hey, Laura. Yeah. But sort of internally, we're, we're trying to move towards the system where the analyst is in the room with the conversation. 
um, or, you know, and, and if it's a sort of multi-departmental talk, then somebody from every side, because I think no matter how good your visualizations are or how good your slideshows are, etc., it's it's very difficult. You know, you can write in words your estimation of the uncertainty, but it's difficult to land that without somebody there who's a good communicator that can sort of explain it. So we're doing a lot of that. And the other thing that we're trying, uh, we're trialing at the moment is where we where we have we have quite a lot of live dashboards now um you know in the prime minister's office that access the various policies that we're we're you know trying to monitor etc um we're trying to embed videos in them where if we think that the analysts won't be there or you know um, very well informed policymakers aren't there there will be a little video that can kind of talk you through the key points to understand so oh, it sounds trivial, but, it's, it's, you know, it, it gives you that human But I love the idea of you do some analysis and a little head pops up and say, oh, no, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't take too much notice of that. I wouldn't trust that number if I were you. Well, it will say, you know, if I draw your attention to this kind of area, you'll see, you know, we don't understand this very well, but we are fairly confident about, you know, this other. So uh, I think analysts if they're doing their job well, uh, should have a very good idea of where the strengths and weaknesses are in the system. And that gives you an opportunity to engage the audience as they're looking at it. It's, it might fall flat, but we're, we're well, doing Well, what you're saying, though, is that, you know, the people actually know about, uh, you know, where the numbers come from and how much weight you should put on them should be there. You, you can't beat the words. It should be up there. Yeah. Up there. Yeah, John, how, you know, how, how do you communicate all this I wouldn't say just uncertainty. It's more just, you know, the, the, the fact that you have not got the whole story. And I think that um, while, you know, most people would love it if you had the whole story, um, most people in, you know, their, their normal daily lives realise that, you know, no one has the whole story. And I think it is it's getting past that initial reaction of, well, what's the answer to, as, as both Laura and Diane have said, is that, that you want a conversation about it that actually brings things out. And most people if they are really trying to do a policy well, want to know where you don't know things because they want to know where they might be surprised or they want to know, well, if this is a bit uncertain, then you know I'm going to have to be slightly careful if I base my entire policy on it if, if you're saying that this is a bit uncertain. So um, while the initial reaction for people is, well, give me the answer, um, in reality, most people um, uh, after a few seconds realise that that's actually never going to be the case. So let's have a proper conversation about it. But it's it's it's, it's having people who are prepared to have that conversation in the room in order to be able to, have to, to do that. There's some you know institutionalised humility, I think, is what's what's needed here. <laughs> oh, Laura, yeah. Sorry, just on that, there's also a lot to be said for actually building in evidence. So, you know, if you have a policy where you genuinely have a lot of uncertainty about the outcomes, and sometimes when you're designing a policy, it's going to be something where there's really no evidence at all, but you kind of common sense suggest that this should work. That's where the policy design becomes very important. You need to put scientific measures into, can we track, you know, the outcomes how, as well as how well del we're delivering? Can we can we come up with some system to, to prove how well it's working? And and, you know, in advance, suggest adjustments we might make. Can we test it differently in one place than another? It starts to become really important. Oh, we've got to have another podcast on this. We can't start <laughs> now. We're nearly finished. But, you know, Sorry. it's so important. You know, it could go on for ages about the importance of, of evaluating as it's going along, adaptive policies. And Anyway, sorry, have to do that another time. OK, I'm going to wind this up now. Um, this has been great. Oh, thank you so much. And I, I, I love what we've been talking about, you know, the, the real importance and the power of effectively communicating data and evidence to policymakers, but also, you know, the, the real caution about obsessing over particular numbers, uh, thinking that numbers, you know, we know people fixate on them too much sometimes, and that it's not the whole story at all. Uh, we've got to make it vivid, but also we've got to communicate it's the limitations of the of the evidence that we've got, um, and that's not just to policymakers. Also, increasingly opening that up to wider audiences, but being very careful about you know the fact that there is there are benefits and possible harms of that greater availability of data to to uh, to the general public. So, um, all I'm going to do is say thank you all so much for a great conversation. Uh, I've learned so much, and um, it's been, you've been a lovely set of people to talk to, and my phenomenal panel, Laura, Diane, and John. Um, and so it's goodbye from me and the Risky Talk team. 
Risky Talk is produced by Elan Goodman at the Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication in the University of Cambridge. Thank you.